uh, special teach-in on Israel-Palestine, you're in the right place. We just want to give this a second for people to join. Um, and we will be getting started in just a moment. We'll give it another 30 seconds because I see the number still going up. All right, so I think we're gonna get started. I wanna be very respectful of people's time on this Friday afternoon in Washington, DC. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second session of our eight part teach-in entitled Israel, Palestine, where we are, what comes next, and why it matters to Congress. I'm Laura Friedman, I'm the president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace, and I'm pleased to be co-hosting this series with Khaled El-Gindi, who is the director of the Middle East Institute's program on Palestine and Palestinian-Israeli affairs. Khaled, over to you. Thanks, Laura. Um, today's session uh, is entitled Israel and Palestine, Human Rights, Occupation, and Democracy. And we have really, uh, we're delighted to have a, a really stellar panel of experts. Uh, I'm going to introduce them here briefly um, in, in alphabetical order. So first we have uh, Isa Amro, who is a Palestinian nonviolent activist and founder of uh, the uh, organization Youth Against Settlements, who is joining us from Hebron in the West Bank. Uh, second, we have uh, Hagai al uh, Director General of B'Tselem, Israel's leading human rights organization, speaking to us from Jerusalem, I believe. Uh, and finally, uh, we have uh, Noura Arakat, who is a human rights attorney and assistant professor at Rutgers University in the Department of Africana Studies and the Program in Criminal Justice. For more about uh, our guests, we'll be putting links to their full bios, websites, and Twitter handles uh, in the chat box. Uh, and keep an eye on the chat box as well for relevant uh, links uh, of any articles or other resources um, regarding today's discussion. Uh, and if you miss anything in the chat box, don't worry. Uh, these materials will be all posted on the web page for the series uh, immediately after the event. So very quickly, the format for this whole teach-in series is a moderated Q&A, which is going to be led by Khaled and myself. We have some basic questions to get things started. Uh, we very much welcome your questions uh, for, your, for our panelists. You should submit those questions via the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Do not use the raise hand function. We can't get rid of that for some reason, but we're not using it. Um, and you can submit them at any time during the webinar. We'll be keeping track of that throughout the time and we'll, we'll, we'll weave your questions in as best we can to the discussion. Also, please note this is being recorded. Um, so everything is on the record. And also, if you have any technical problems or questions during the webinar, put those into the chat box, which our colleagues are monitoring and taking care of. So with that, let's begin. Khaled. Uh, thanks, Laura. So, um, so just by way of introduction, uh, as many of you know, the situation in Israel and the occupied territories is complicated uh, in the sense that we have two different entities operating in the area between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River, the state of Israel and the Palestinian Authority, which itself is actually divided into two different parts. And we'll discuss that later. Uh, complicating matters even further, uh, the UN, along with dozens of other countries around the world, recognized Palestine as a state. Of course, the United States does not, uh, albeit a state under that, that is under uh, occupation. As a result, there's a lot of confusion, even among policymakers and experts, regarding where Israel's responsibilities end and where the Palestinian authorities uh, begin. Uh, for example, things like, and we've heard a lot about this in, in, in recent uh, uh, news, uh, things like providing COVID vaccines to the population. So I want to start with Noura. Um, help us set, uh, set the scene, please, if you could. Given this complex reality uh, on the ground of occupation, where does Israel stand with regard to its obligations under international law can you give us a kind of lay of the land in terms of which party is responsible for what and where and what it means for Palestine to be under occupation, particularly on the question of the applicability of the Oslo Accords on the one hand uh, and uh, that of international humanitarian law on the other? 
Thank you, Khaled and Lara. Thank you to Brookings and the Foundation for Middle East Peace and to my esteemed fellow panelists. Uh, this is a confusing question because we get into a lot of legal debates and as any lawyer trained attorney knows, that's not, there are no definitive answers. So I'll give you the lay of the land and kind of the issues that come up and at least the standards by which you can resolve those issues. Um, on the first hand, I think Khaled, you know, just to emphasize, it's one thing to say, Israel ex exercises singular jurisdiction from the Mediterranean Sea to the River Jordan. And another thing to emphasize that at present, as of 2021, uh, the Gaza Strip um, remains under a land siege and naval blockade where they cannot control uh, the entry or exit of, of people's goods, medicines. They, don't e they cannot even control their own electricity, right? In the West Bank, which includes uh, East Jerusalem, you have a situation where the settler population has increased to 600,000 from 200,000 in 1993 when the Oslo Accords began. The West Bank itself is divided into overlapping jurisdictions of area A, B, and C, um, indicating uh, the shared responsibility between that was meant to be temporary but has become permanent between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. That territory itself is divided into non, uh, 20 non-contiguous territories that Palestinians regard as their reservations or Bantustans. Uh, East Jerusalem itself is off limits to most Palestinians, despite that being the supposed capital. Worse, um, Israel is conducting an ongoing removal process uh, tantamount to ethnic cleansing to alter the demographic balance between Jews um, Jewish Israelis and Arab Palestinians in East Jerusalem, which then has nothing to do with sovereignty, but is just about being able to stay in one, one's home. The reason I say all these things is to emphasize that there is at the crux of this, a human rights crisis and a humanitarian crisis. And that becomes obfuscated through the language of peacemaking, which is then refracted through the legalese that you've asked me to set up. So what about the legalese? Um, right now, because this is a condition of an occupation, if we begin in 1967, an occupation that's over 50 years old, in humanitarian law, occupation is a legal condition meant to last from five to 10 years in order to facilitate the transition from wartime to peacetime. Israel's prolonged occupation has been scrutinized not only as illegal, but given, giving rise to a condition of a different reality that some have described as apartheid. This would invoke two bodies of law, humanitarian law, and human rights law. And the, the, the International Court of Justice has settled this question by saying, and the Israeli Supreme Court, by the way, has settled this question by saying that they can overlap, okay? Even if you're not a lawyer, what you need to keep in mind is three things. Number one, I had to write, is, is that overlap, that these conditions um, overlap. The second is that which one you decide to highlight, right, is ultimately a political decision so that we have the U one UN ESQA release a report that concludes that Israel administers an apartheid regime. Beit Salem has concluded, um, come to the same conclusion over this entire territory and that we need to dismantle this, not through peacemaking, but actually through the dismantlement of these discriminatory racialized laws, right? At the same time, you have the United States, right, agreeing to uh, UN Security Council resolution in at the end of uh, the Obama administration's term that recognizes this, this as occupied territories and demands that the settlements be dismantled, thereby reifying an occupation framework. My, you know, the, the thing that we need to remember is it's a human rights crisis and a humanitarian crisis. How you, what law you decide to resolve this with is a political decision. At present, the political decision that Israel has taken together with the United States' support is not to apply either of these frameworks, but instead to impose under the framework of deal of the century, but also the de facto reality, is to impose these crises as a permanent feature of Palestinian life. So that rather than any of these being temporary, rather than any of these being um, mentioned as crises, they become the norm and Palestinians have to live with them 
um, either through economic infusion, financial um, economic support and infusion, or other USAID pro projects that somehow connect the Palestinians through one another, and regimes that make this reservation slash Bantu Stan reality into a permanent condition that when Palestinians say we reject, then makes them seem to be non um, non movable and in opposition to peace. When in fact, what they and we want to highlight is that this is a crisis. This is a human rights condition of our time that we need to address, and we have many tools available to us. The issue is to 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 use something and to make the political decision to impose them. Thanks, Nora. And that's a great framing for Haggai because you know this this is very framing this clearly in the human rights context, which is what today's conversation is about. Haggai, you are the head of Israel's leading human rights organization, veteran human rights organization. You are a veteran human rights defender. Can you talk about the overall human rights situation in the occupied territories and how it relates to the situation across the Green Line inside Israel? And also, can you talk a little bit, and you know, we're talking, this, this event is being you know, really set up so that members, uh, Congress and members of their staff can learn about this. Why should this matter to Congress? They have a lot on their plate. Why should they care? Okay, uh, so thank you, uh, FMEP, and thank you, MEI. And I'll do my best to address the question, but before that, I just wanna take a step back and just say something about uh, the question that, uh, that you offered to, to Nora in the context of, uh, of complexity. Because, uh, like, um, I, I think it's one of my um, pains uh, in dealing with with human rights, and this like notion that things are so complicated that if you're not uh, like an international law expert, you don't have the capacity to actually see what's uh, really understand what's going on and uh, and critique it. And it is correct that Israel has managed to create this, you know, really complicated and multi layered uh, reality that you know. Nora laid out with such with such clarity, but at the same time, uh, I think it is also very true. Uh, I still hold on to that belief that generally speaking, human beings in good faith have a very immediate ability, regardless of their legal education or absence of, to identify injustice when they see it uh, and reject it uh, as such. And I think with that in mind, anyone that has been paying attention. Um, beyond the legal details, uh, we'll be able to see right through the Israeli charade uh, of what's what's going on and identify reality for what it is, the permanent subjugation of one people by another with impunity. And that is a gross injustice, which the United States is implicated in, going back to why Congress needs to address this issue. Um, and, and that needs to be accessible, I think, to any decent person that analyzes this, uh, this this reality. So I just wanted to say that up, up front. The other thing is like the question was, uh, and I will focus only on the situation on the other side of the green line as the question was, was framed in East Jerusalem, in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip. But as we already heard the beginnings of, and as I'll get to later in this, in this conversation, uh, we have a lot to say also about what's going on on the other side of, of the green line and the need to analyze the situation, looking at the entire area under Israel's control, if we really want to understand what's going on and if we really, and if we really want to address the situation properly. Uh, but what's happening on the other side of the green line is one of the major aspects of this reality and it's worth its own analysis uh, and I'm happy to, happy to do that. If one begins addressing that, you already immediately see one of the main attributes that are you know, unique to this Israeli system of control over Palestinians, with, which is the fact that what is going on on the other side of the Green Line is in fact um, separated into three different subdivisions. It's not the same situation if you're a Palestinian uh, living in the one part of the West Bank that was already formally annexed, East Jerusalem, and more than 20 Palestinian villages around that, the one part that was formally annexed immediately after 1967. Uh, it's a different situation if you're a Palestinian living, uh, Palestinian subject living in the other parts of the West Bank that have been de facto annexed, but not formally annexed. And it's a different situation if you're one of the two million Palestinians living in the Gaza Strip in, one, in what has become one of the biggest open air prisons on the planet. 
Um, so there are differences for Palestinians. Obviously, the fourth unit would be the situation inside Israel proper, inside the Green Line. Now, what is, but as I said, I'm focusing only on the situation in the OPT. Now, what is happening in those areas isn't only Israel's ability to advance the project that it desires, take over the land and not give Palestinians rights, but also the unique ability of Israel to do that with impunity. And I think that's a key aspect, especially as like we're talking to uh, you know, people abroad uh, and people that are part of the US administration uh, to understand that these are the two major uh, aspects of the Israeli success from the, from the perspective of, of Israel. Not only the ability to build settlements, expand them, advance the militias against Palestinians, do everything else that we do, have this absolute control over Palestinian lives, but also the ability to get away with it with impunity. Because if we had accountability, if there were consequences, then also we would have a different kind of conversation about where the, you know, where the Jewish public in Israel would have been on this issue. And we'll, I, I hope we'll get more to address that aspect uh, looking, uh, looking forward. Often, uh, Israel's ability to get away with it is related to certain tactics that are used, right? So like, for instance, lip service about two-state solution, future negotiations, don't worry about it right now, that's one of them. Uh, guise of legality is another one, insisting that actually every human rights violation we do against Palestinians actually is legal. There is legal recourse, they can petition, and so on and so forth. But eventually, once you examine it, what you see is that Israel's legal system has basically approved each and any human rights violation that Israel commits against Palestinians, right? But it does provide that guise of legality. Another aspect of the ability to do it and get away with it is patience not to do too much too soon, to always fly two inches below the level of international outrage. So for instance, if, a certain, if the demolition of a certain Palestinian community gets too much attention, Khan al-Akhmar, east of Jerusalem, is a key example, then maybe just send the bulldozers somewhere else, right? Uh, and maybe wait six months, maybe wait a year, uh, maybe go and demolish another part of the West Bank, and so on. So the collection of these tactics doesn't change the reality, but it allows Israel and it allows uh, stakeholders internationally to look the other way uh, and to allow for all this to continue with impunity, which is such a key aspect of this uh, of this ability. Um, yeah, maybe I'll pause here. Thank you, Haggai. Um, I wanna turn to um, Isa and sort of zoom in from the big picture to the situation on the ground. As a Palestinian human rights defender uh, working in Hebron, you personally have been subjected to various forms of harassment and persecution by both the Palestinian Authority, uh, presumably your own government, uh, and the Israeli military that, that occupies the, the, the whole West Bank, um, as well as by extremist settlers living in Hebron. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the human rights situation in Palestine more broadly, um, uh, and in particular with regard to Hebron, because Hebron is unique among Palestinian uh, urban centers in that there is, uh, aside from Jerusalem, it's the only, uh, it's the only place in the West Bank that has uh, a contingent of uh, Israeli settlers in the heart of the city, uh, and quite ideologically hardcore uh, settlers at that. Um, and also, if you could tell us a little bit about why you think you're being targeted by both Palestinian and Israeli authorities. Isa, you're muted. Uh, thank you, Khaled. Thank you, Lara. Uh, thank you for organizing this. Uh... Uh, you know, a very important briefing to describe the situation in the ground these days. Uh, I can say that uh, Betzelem published uh, their report uh, describing the situation from the river to the sea as, a, as an apartheid. I was talking about that very, very long time ago, and I will describe what I meant and what is the, really the situation in the ground. The situation in the ground as the former American uh, ambassador to Israel 2016 described it, described it 
two sets of law in the same area. We as Palestinians, we are living under the Israeli military law, which means that we are completely without any basic human rights. We don't exist even in the law. Our testimonies are not valid as Palestinians, even to defend ourselves. On the other hand, the Israeli settlers who are living in the same area are under the Israeli uh, civilian law. And there is even, we are complaining that even that the Israeli uh, security system is not enforcing the civilian law on the Israeli settlers. I can say it openly from my own uh, very long experience, the settlers have impunity and they are not accountable for what they are doing. Just before I, we start this uh, you know, uh, Zoom, settlers threw stones at my house and I was hit on my hand in front of the soldiers and they filed a complaint to the Israeli police and I'm sure it's without any uh, let me say outcome or the settlers will not be accountable. So the first time it's many, many times. What is happening in West Bank that the Israeli government now is, uh, let me say, imposing its de facto annexation of West Bank. So they have a massive amount of settlement units uh, planned, announced, uh, tendered. Yesterday they announced around 900 new units in Al Malha in Jerusalem. And every day we hear about new units. Not only that, they are building new uh, infrastructure, bridges, roads, they are expanding the roads only for the settlers. So they, they are building really infrastructure for the, I can say that the settlement state, you know, they want to reach to 1 million uh, settlers for sure without any Palestinian uh, possibility to, uh, to expand or to be part of this uh, development. They develop the settlement and they de-develop the Palestinian economy and they, they, they developed the Palestinian, uh, uh, let me say, society. You can read the Sarah Roy book uh, uh, about the development in, in, in Gaza and in West Bank. And Sarah Roy is a Jewish Harvard scholar. You can, you know, read her, her book. Uh, the situation in West Bank, it's really hard for the Palestinians the, these days. I can say that the price tag campaigners, settlers, tourist group, and the Hilltop Youth, another terrorist group, Livni, the former American, uh, the former uh, Israeli uh, justice minister, asked Netanyahu to announce them as a terrorist organization, but he refused for political reason. Why to announce them as a terrorist organization? Because they organized, uh, uh, you know, violent attacks uh, against Palestinians. They were behind killing uh, Abu Khdeir uh, in, in Jerusalem. They killed the Labshi family. They killed. A Rabi uh, woman in, in Naples, and they attack Palestinian cars, they attack Palestinian, uh, let me say, property, they attack villages, and we see massive amount of attacks from the Israeli settlers in all over West Bank these days without any real intervention uh, from the Israeli uh, security forces. In, in the contrary, you know, uh, Israeli soldiers are there to protect the settlers even during their, their attacks against the Palestinians. Uh, Area C is completely controlled by the Israeli settlers. And, you know, the Israeli government, uh, Netanyahu government, nowadays they are doing a lot of demolition orders, a training in the Palestinian, uh, let me say, villages, and they, they, they really make our life is impossible. And I want to use Hebron as a case, case study of what is happening all over uh, West Bank. We are living in 2021. I can say that uh, we are segregated. You will see segregated streets, segregated bathrooms. I can see certain bathrooms, public bathrooms in, 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 in Shohada Street, but I'm not allowed to reach to, to those restrooms. Uh, uh, you know, uh, segregated benches, I can't sit on them, in spite that it's in my own city. And even in the area where I was born, you can see, uh, let me say, bus station. I can't use the buses. The settlers can use the buses. I can't go to Jerusalem, you know, even to file complaint to the police station. We have a special entrance, you know, to go to the police station and you wait hours, you know, on, uh, on, on, you know, on, on the police station. And, and, you know, and you can, you know, you, can, you give up to, to file a complaint because it, it takes very, very long time because it's a different system for you and for the settlers and your testimony is not valid. You know, in, in the Hebron city, uh, we have, the two sets of law in the same area. You know, I was attacked many times by settlers, many, many times by settlers. And I was arrested after being attacked. And one of the charges I was convicted in the military court 
uh, it was 2010 when I was working in Beit Salem as the camera distribution project coordinator. Israeli settlers attacked a Palestinian family. They tried to break into the house of the family to the private property of the Palestinian family. I was there filming. I was attacked by the settler and I was convicted in the military court because the settler claimed that I attacked him. Uh, convicted means I can be charged, you know, up to five years in jail for, let me say, only being attacked by a settler and the military system is against me and the civilian system, it's for the Israeli settler. In my city, Hebron, we have 1,800 shops closed because of the closure uh, policy, which made the life of the Palestinian people almost impossible. Unemployment rate is more than 70% in this area. Poverty rate is more than 80% because of the closure of 1,800 shops. They shut up the main squares, the main streets. I can say that our Times Square, Shohada Street is completely closed for the Palestinians and all the shops were, were, were closed. And Beit Salem and Acre, in 2007 described it as a ghost town. Until now, it's a ghost town. We have uh, more than 1,000 Palestinian apartments empty without Palestinian population because of the closure policy and because of the continuous attacks from the Israeli settlers and soldiers, for sure. 22 checkpoints in one kilometer square. Imagine that 22 checkpoints in one kilometer square, 100 movement barriers restricting our freedom of movement. And if you resist that, and if you try to expose that, and if you try to make that visible, you will be a target for the Israeli uh, occupation and for the Israeli settlers. I got five stitches, three stitches. My nose was broken. All my body was attacked by the settlers. 2019, uh, I, I lead tours in the city. I was attacked more than eight times physically by the Israeli settlers, and for sure, without any accountability, for the uh, Israeli settlers or the soldiers who, um, you know, let me say, violate even the Israeli uh, civilian law. Uh, on the other hand, we are really, uh, you know, in need of health care. Uh, you skip all the emergency cases because ambulance doesn't have direct access to H2 in Hebron. We need to do uh, coordination in advance. So you skip the, the golden minute. Not only that, the neighbor settlers, you know, a few meters from here, they got vaccinated for COVID-19. We, the Palestinians, we didn't get that. We are, the, we are under the Israeli military control. We live in the, an area with, which is completely under the Israeli military control. I can say that all over Palestine is under the Israeli military control. Our president can't travel from his city, Ramallah, to come to Hebron without a permit from the Israeli civil administration. Gaza is completely sieged. So it's a responsibility of the occupation to give us uh, the vaccine not to try to say that Palestinians, they have now, you know, their own government. We don't have our own government. Our government doesn't have any authority and cyber record who passed away because of COVID-19 described it many times that Palestinian authority is without any authority. About me, uh, why they are targeting me? No, they are targeting any Palestinian who is resisting the Israeli occupation peacefully because according to the Israeli military law, we are not allowed to have any kind of peaceful resistance. Marching with more than 10, no, not marching, even meeting with more than 10 is an illegal, uh, you know, according to the Israeli uh, military law. So it's not about me, it's about every Palestinian tries to resist the Israeli uh, occupation. And we have many, many other cases. I am famous, this is why you know about me, but many, many other Palestinians were indicted, convicted, and they were jailed because they were peacefully resisting the Israeli occupation. And unfortunately, we didn't hear any uh, comment, any, let me say, critical uh, criticism of the Israeli policies of going after the Palestinian nonviolence uh, resistance. For sure, the Israeli occupation doesn't want any you know, nonviolence uh, advocates. So they, they try to shut off the voices of the Palestinian nonviolence leaders. Not only that, B'Tselem was attacked by the Israeli uh, government, breaking, breaking the silence was attacked by the Israeli government. Uh, Al-Haq was attacked by the, you know, by the Israeli government. The Gaza coordinator of World Vision, humanitarian organization is in jail since I think, uh, you know, maybe two years or three years, he's in jail for giving uh, humanitarian aid to the Gazans. And they didn't prove at all that he 
participated in anything illegal, but that is the Israeli military system. You are guilty till you are proving innocent. It's the opposite of the civilian uh, law. Uh, and the Palestinian, even, you know, the, the occupation, you know, shrinking spaces of the organizations, smear, smear campaigns, threatening the, 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 the employees of the certain organizations, going after the funding. They ask many countries not to give funds to B'Tselem or to, to breaking the silence. Uh, I, can, I can say it, and to yes, and to any uh, other Palestinian human rights activists or human rights uh, organization. About me personally, I can say that the settlers, they have a huge influence on the Israeli military system and especially the military court. They asked, uh, you know, the formal who announced on his Twitter a few days ago that he's very proud that he was the one who uh, created the indictment against me, that I am a liar and I'm living in Hebron and making, he's a settler and he will work in favor of the settlers. And, and the settlers in 2013, after I, I organized Obama, Martin Luther King, a march in Shuhada Street. Uh, I can say that they complained about my 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 nonviolence approach to the Israeli army, to the Israeli police, and they should me should put me in administrative detention. I can say that what initiated my my indictment 2016 was that I organized a nonviolence action with many American activists. Uh, especially Jew young Jewish uh, American who came to Palestine to help me create a cinema in Hebron and they wear a t-shirt, occupation is not our Judaism. I hope that the American lawmakers will, will start working that their foreign policy will be changed to make the occupation not their own, let me say, blind support to Israel because the occupation is supported by, by the, unfortunately, by the, uh, you know, by the American administration directly or uh, indirectly and I, I and they, when they started you know going after me 2016 they know that I reached many American uh, lawmakers many American celebrities many American human rights organizations and many American Jews so they don't want my voice to reach uh, all, everybody in the world not only me many other Palestinians I'm, I'm, I'm famous so uh, you know about my my case so they don't want any voices to uh, let me say, expose the Israeli apartheid, Israeli segregation, and the Israeli occupation. So instead of ending the apartheid, ending the occupation, and ending the human rights violations, they want uh, do, to shut off our voices so the world will not hear about what is happening on the ground. Thank you, Isa. And there was a lot packed into that, and we're not, probably not going to get to cover all of it. We could have an entire separate webinar just on settler violence which is an issue that is surging right now. I would encourage people who are interested in this to basically read the news. This is being covered pretty extensively in the Israeli media, it's covered in the Palestinian media, it's covered by you know, groups like B'Tselem and Yeshdin. There are reports on this almost every day. There are videos circulating on Twitter. You don't have to believe someone telling you that this is happening. You can actually watch videos of it pretty much every day um, and see for yourself. Um, and as, as Haggai said, the, the reality is pretty, pretty clear as you, as you watch these videos. Um, Isa, I want to move on to Haggai. And by the way, we, we had it in the introduction in the, in the invitation. I wanna make sure people know that Isa actually um, has been through a long court process. He was recently actually convicted of a whole list of um, violations, which include things like insulting a soldier, for allegedly calling someone stupid. Some of these date back more than 10 years. None of them are violent. And we are now awaiting um, what the actual um, sentencing will be. I'm very happy that Issa was able to be with us here today. I was a little worried he would be under detention. I'm happy he's not under detention in general, but it also works out well for us to have him here today. So thank you for that. Um, I wanna move to Haggai. So Issa has delayed out the situation in Hebron and also more broadly the West Bank. Um, B'Tselem published a groundbreaking report just recently, which actually used the word apartheid to describe the situation on both sides of the green line together. We'd had previous people more recently, Michal Svard coming out with the judgment that the West Bank is a situation where apartheid is the correct term. B'Tselem went a step further and said, no, you can properly characterize the entire area as an apartheid regime. Can you talk about this um, and, and why uh, B'Tselem came to this conclusion and why at this particular moment? 
um, and, and what it means in your mind for the future of Israelis and Palestinians. And I know in your mind, this is not about describing something that is, you know, this is terrible and everything's terrible, but it's actually about trying to open a way forward to make things different and better. Um, so can you talk about that? And I, I ask you to keep in mind, since we have congressional staff on this call, this is at a moment when in Congress, we are seeing increasing um, inclinations or pressures to drop even the word occupation um, from the lexicon as if that is somehow unfair and anti-Israel. And we have seen members of Congress who have used the word apartheid attacked as not only anti-Israel, but anti-Semitic. Um, so can you, can you place it within that context uh, for our audience? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, maybe just before going there, I just wanted to like relate to Issa, what Issa was uh, was describing so so eloquently. Uh, so, so I, I was like taking notes, uh, and I thought it's like worth pointing out, you know, just like three points uh, from from what Issa shared. So, what is the situation in Hebron, and the way Palestinians are pushed out of the city center, uh, and Israeli Jewish settlers are moving in? The second point is the complete absence of free speech for Palestinians under Israeli occupation. Uh, and the third point is uh, the military courts and their conviction rate, which is close to 100%. It's like between 97 to 99%, right? Um, and just like, you know, to, to invite people to like, you know, retell themselves the, you know, the facts that Isa is shared, like bearing these things in mind, right? So I spoke before about the guise of legality and so on. So like the situation in Hebron isn't some random occurrence that is happening because there's a bunch of finance settlers that are acting against state policy. That's not the case. The situation in Hebron has been litigated numerous times before the Israeli high court. And what Isa has described is legal from Israel's perspective, right? It has been accepted. It is state policy. Right? This is not happening because a bunch of like bad dudes is doing something awful. Right? This is the official, official situation. Uh, the military order that erases Palestinian uh, political free speech is in place since 1967. Right? That's the law. It's not an exception right? uh, for Palestinians, not for Israelis. Uh, and military courts, uh, you know, if there will be like a spokesperson here for the Israeli foreign ministry, then, you know, they would love to talk about, you know, the ability to petition and to process and, and so on. Yeah, kangaroo courts that convict almost every Palestinian that is brought before them, right? That's the reality. And all this, just also to make that uh, factor in, isn't something that Palestinians need to somehow deal with for, you know, a temporary duration of the uh, you know, the, what is supposed to be like a temporary occupation for a few months, a few years. No, this is the reality that's going on and getting worse for more than half a century by this, uh, by this point in time, which connects me to, uh, to apartheid. Uh, before I go there, I just want to say uh, that obviously, we're not the first ones uh, to come to this conclusion. Many Palestinians have been saying this before us. Uh, Palestinian activists like Isa, Palestinian scholars, and activists like Noah uh, and others. Uh, and I hope that also that we will, so we're definitely not the first ones. I also very much hope that we're not the last ones. Uh, I hope that this will become the mainstream way for decent, good people around the world to understand the reality between the river and the sea so they can address it properly. Uh, and we believe, and this is the point in which this is not a moment of, of despair, but perhaps a moment of optimism, we still believe that facts matter, and we still believe that calling things by the proper name brings us a step closer to addressing what needs to be addressed in the correct fashion. So the wrong analysis leads to the wrong conclusions. Maybe the correct analysis leads to a better outcome, right? And we're saying this, A, just because, just because we think this is the correct way of seeing things, but also I'm very hopeful that thanks to the works of others uh, and thanks to our modest contribution, it will be possible to change the discourse. Now, in the background, what is at play here is a struggle between two worldviews. One worldview is an analysis of the situation that, in short end, I would call it democracy plus occupation. That Israel inside the green line is a democracy, perhaps not a perfect one, but a democracy. And attached to it, on the other side of the green line, 
there's this temporary occupation project that needs to be addressed, right? So democracy plus occupation. Uh, and that, what that does, uh, well, first, I just want to say what I think is obvious. That is completely untethered from reality, right? That you cannot somehow save good Israel from its bad occupation project, right? There is one government, one regime, and that's the key aspect that people need to wake up first and foremost, that there's one regime, one government, and controls everyone and everything between the river and the sea. We have 14 million people that live in this part of the world. Half of them are Jews, half of them are Palestinian, uh, but there's one regime. We're all under that one regime. And what Israel does on the other side of the green line isn't conducted by you know, a military coup that happened by Israel's central command that is acting somehow independently from the government, right? No, these are government policies. And if you still pretend that this is democracy plus occupation, then what about the more than 600,000 Jewish settlers that live on the other side of the green line, but as if they're living inside Israel proper? Like for them, the green line does not exist. It is a demarcation that makes a big difference for Palestinians, as so many other lines make a big difference for Palestinians in terms of the different levels of subjugation that they suffer by Israel. But for the more than half a million settlers, it doesn't matter where you live between the river and the sea, right? Um, so, and it erases, still thinking about democracy plus occupation, still somehow pretends that this is temporary and this has not has been going on for more than 50 years. So these are you know, just some of like the main aspects why we need to wake up to the reality that this is indeed one, one regime. Now, obviously, um, one of the big problems in this, in this worldview is that tethered to it is the insistence that some people will acknowledge that it could get worse. It could get worse in a terrible way in the future, always in the future, right? So that's like the big joke about the two minutes to midnight. It's always two minutes to midnight. Uh, and the recent expression of that is what happened during 2020, during the extended arguments, discussions about formal annexation of additional parts of the West Bank under the Trump plan, right? And then what you heard was many people that have said during those months of 2020, that if formal annexation would take place, even a single square inch, that was the refrain, a single square inch uh, of annexation, uh, additional annexation, because parts of the West Bank already were formally annexed, East Jerusalem, but a single additional square inch that would be annexed, then it would become apartheid. That was the, the, the framing, which again says, it's two minutes to midnight because the jure annexation did not take place eventually, right? We traded that in exchange for normalization with the UAE and other countries. So situation continues, 53 years plus and counting, and it's still two minutes to midnight, right? And if you've noticed, if you follow the news since the jury was taken off the table, um, did settlement expansion stop? Of course not. Did demolitions stop? Of course not. Did the killings of Palestinians with impunity stop? Of course not, because what mattered is what we've said already before. What matters is Israel's total control and the ability to advance the Jewish project at the expense of Palestinians with impunity, which was the case before and was the case after, because thanks to de facto annexation, we do what we want and we get away with it. Now, when you come to terms with that understanding that this is a one regime, that the time is not two minutes to midnight, but past midnight, you also have to come to terms with understanding that the principle of advancing Jewish supremacy is the single principle that is held and advanced by the government, not only on the other side of the green line, but also inside Israel proper, right? And that's the analysis that we presented in the position paper that we published exactly a month ago. So first, there's the understanding that this is a one regime. Then there's the laying out of the fact that for Jews, it doesn't matter where you live, you get the full protections and rights that the government provides anywhere. For Palestinians, different four subdivisions, uh, Israel proper, East Jerusalem, West Bank, Gaza Strip. And in each and every one of these, Palestinians get a subset of less rights. It's not the same everywhere, there's a difference in your level of oppression and subjugation if you're a citizen or a permanent president or West Banker 
or in Gaza. But in each and every one of these subunits, the subset of uh, what you get is less than what a Jewish person would receive, right? And as a result of that, what you see is that there's not a single square inch within the river and the sea in which a Jewish person and a Palestinian would be equal, right? Um, and then we lay out, uh, I think with, in great nuance and, and detail, the way this is realized in terms of, for instance, uh, the re-engineering of space, right? So what happens to land between the river and the sea? Land is always moving in one direction, from Palestinian hands to Jewish hands, and then is being used for Jewish development. That has been the case inside the Green Line since 1948, since the establishment of the state. That has been the case on the other side of the Green Line since the beginning of the occupation. So the re-engineering of space. Then there's re-engineering of demographics, right? Who can immigrate? Who can gain personal status within the river and the sea? Jews. And who cannot? Palestinians. That happens on both sides of the Green Line. And we also look at other aspects in which the situation is more complicated in terms of freedom of movement and in terms of political rights, right? Where in those aspects, if you examine the situation of Palestinian citizens, those that are living inside uh, the Green Line, then there would be other differences in the situation compared to the situation for Palestinians in one of the other subunits of that, uh, of that reality. All in all together, when you put all these things together, you just, if, and if you judge it in, in good faith, as, as I think we have done, as others have done before us, uh, you come to that conclusion that what this regime does is having the same policy between the river and the sea, advancing that principle of Jewish supremacy over Palestinians in a situation, I want to emphasize that just for conclusion, in a situation of demographic parity, right? Seven million and seven million. And obviously, once you think about that aspect, then you can see how, all the, how the system works to guarantee that that demographic parity will never translate into parity in political power, which would then hopefully translate into parity in, you know, in rights and justice uh, as, as we think about uh, the future of this, uh, of this place. Uh, last thing I want to say, because you also touched on, on anti-Semitism, I should have said this before, because I said in the previous answer that uh, the Israeli success is not only advancing the project, but also getting away with it. And then I enumerated what the tactics that are used in order to get away with it, guys of legality, lip service, doing it one step at a time. I forgot to mention silencing criticism, right? And that's the other uh, additional layer of that ability of getting away with it. And silencing criticism, right, is invoked internationally. The key way that is done is through false accusations of anti-Semitism, right? Like Netanyahu uh, hasn't invented that uh, Israeli uh, tactic, but certainly has advanced it into new realms uh, of, uh, I think, shame and disgrace by openly aligning himself with white supremacists and anti-Semites from Viktor Orban to Donald Trump and many others in between, while it, and forgiving their anti-Semitism because they would be politically supportive to the, pros, to the project of oppressing Palestinians, right? While at the same time, so like you know, ignoring genuine anti-Semites, while at the same time invoking false accusations of anti-Semitism. Of course, some of the critiques of this reality are not only internationals. So for others, there are other mechanisms of silencing, right? So for Palestinians, it would often be uh, suggesting, uh, targeting them as if they support uh, violence, as if they're terrorists, right? So that's the way you go after Palestinian activists. Uh, Issa mentioned uh, El Haq uh, in, his, in his comments. The executive director of El Haq, Shawan Jabarin, is a person that is targeted in that fashion. Uh, as official Israeli policy, right? You go to the you know, terrorist in suits uh, report, like that's what they do, right? Uh, and for Jewish Israelis that are critiquing this reality, we would be often be framed as traitors. Thank you, uh, thank you, Haggai. Um, I appreciate the fact that you laid out your uh, reasoning behind the, the use of the term apartheid so uh, rationally. Uh, because I think very often people think of it as a provocation or you're being hyperbolic or this is just a way to get attention. Um, and, and so I, I appreciate you uh, sort of dispassionately breaking it down for us. 
Um, I wanted to turn now to, uh, to Noura to talk about another major development in the human rights uh, arena. Just last week, as you know, uh, the International Criminal Court, the ICC issued a controversial ruling in which it confirmed that it did in fact have jurisdiction to hear complaints uh, in the occupied Palestinian territories against uh, all, uh, any and all armed groups, whether they're Israeli military or Palestinian armed groups uh, in the occupied territories. Um, that decision, of course, was welcomed by Palestinians across the board, uh, but was firmly rejected by both Israel and uh, US officials. Um, in uh, speaking now as a obviously a, a human rights lawyer, what is the basis for the ICC's ruling um, on what grounds uh, also do, do the US and Israel object to it? Um, and what does it mean going forward? Will we be seeing Israeli officials or Hamas uh, uh, operatives for that matter being brought before uh, the court? Um, how might Israel and the US respond to any future investigation? Um, and can you also address why this issue matters for Congress in particular, bearing in mind uh, that Congress every year passes a law in the, the foreign appropriations bill, legislating sanctions against any international body that admits the Palestinians as a state, uh, including the ICC, um, uh, and against the Palestinians for seeking uh, that admission to begin with. So I know that's throwing a lot at you, but um, if you could, uh, if you could also do it in like three or four minutes would be great. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, we're all asked um, to be giving treatises, you know, to provide treatises in a, in a um, Cliff's Notes here. So I'll try my best um, and also make it germane to Congress. I think somebody has asked a question in the Q&A about, you know, what Congress is going to do. And what's evident here is that these these things, the condition of apartheid, the the persecution of Isa for his, his denial from being able to walk across the street or to hold anybody to account or even have the right to self-defense, God forbid, is backed and, and maintained by congressional support. And so this is everything to do with um, how this plays out in Congress and, and why we're having this conversation here. On the ICC, first of all, the only reason that the ruling is considered controversial, because the ruling was a very simple legal decision. The only reason that it's considered controversial is because of US and Israeli opposition to the ICC well before um, the, the possibility of either country being examined by the International Criminal Court. The US has not been a party to the International Criminal Court. Israel has refused to be a party, citing that the Rome Statute, which actually um, defines war crimes uh, verbatim the way the fourth Geneva Convention has defined war crimes, citing that as the politicization of the body. So well before this moment, Israel has described the ICC as politicized and not legal because of the language of the Rome Statute, which brings it into existence. And the US has entered into bilateral agreements across the globe that guarantees that none of its military personnel will be prosecuted by the International Tribunal. We should remember that background and understanding that regardless of what the court would have done or not done, that this controversial term is basically controversial insofar as the US and Israel do not feel that it should be subject to its jurisdiction. Bring up to date, what is the issue now? In 2009, Palestinians tried uh, to apply to the ICC for examination of Israeli war crimes. Um, at the time in 2009, that petition was rejected because the ICC said that Palestine is not a state, therefore lacks jurisdiction. When Palestinians went to the General Assembly and were unequivocally voted and recognized as a non-member state of the United Nations, this settled the issue of Palestinian statehood, even though it's embryonic and not actually um, in fact. That gave it the capacity to apply again in 2015 to become a party to the Rome Statute, which basically settled the issue. You can't become a party to the Rome Statute, subject to the criminal court, if you're not a state. All the ICC has had to do is basically answer the question, is Palestine a state simply for the purpose of jurisdiction? Not answering the question of what the 
the, the boundaries are, the borders, not answering the question of legal obligation, merely answering the question for jurisdictional purposes, is Palestine a state, which the facts evident, show are self-evident. It was voted as such by the General Assembly. It is a party to the Rome Statute. It can't become a party if it's not a state. I can't sign the Rome Statute, right? Um, and so that question took five years between 2015 and 2020, uh, 2020, when the Office of the Prosecutor found that yes, Palestine is a state for the purpose of jurisdiction, that was Fatu Bansuda in December 2020. And just a, a week or two ago, because, it's, because this is so sensitive, she wanted the pretrial chamber, a panel of three other ICC judges to examine the same question which they did all to answer a question that isn't actually legally complicated. So this is where we're at now. This is why there's been rejection and there's been accusations. Netanyahu has called this anti-Semitic. And yet what we have is the most basic, which means nothing, which means absolutely nothing. Just because it has jurisdiction doesn't mean there'll be an investigation. Fatou Bansouda needs to now decide whether or not they will proceed with an investigation. And even if she does make that decision in the affirmative, that's not permanent because there's going to be a new prosecutor appointed in June. That new prosecutor, from what we hear, is, is they're angling for somebody named Kareem Khan, who is a favorite of the United States and Israel, who would table and shelve all investigations of Israel and the United States. Now, let's say it's not Kareem Khan. Let's say that the investigation proceeds. What is next on the horizon? There are a few things. Number one, according to the Rome Statute, if Israel has the capacity to criminally investigate itself, that supplants the jurisdiction of the ICC and makes it move. Israel already has a number of criminal um, cases open to investigate itself for the um, war on Gaza. The only thing that Israel refuses to investigate itself for are the settlement is the settlement enterprise. And that is what Israel wants to keep out of the purview of the court, right? But what we should also understand is that the most simple cases for which the ICC will have jurisdiction and will precede any investigation of Israel will be for Hamas. Hamas's use of um, you know, military violence against Israel because it's reckless, meaning that it doesn't have the capacity because of its crude nature to distinguish between civilian and, and non-civilian targets or civilian and military targets would be ipso facto illegal. So the one thing that we can know for sure is that if the ICC investigation proceeds, Hamas members will be prosecuted with greater simplicity and surety than would Israel's um, um, crime work alleged war crimes in the Gaza Strip and surely before its settlement enterprise. All of that said, add to this the background that part of what Israel and the US have tried to do and successfully achieved through the establishment of the Oslo peace process is to bifurcate a, a political process from a legal process. And the US and Israel at every juncture have seen that any application of international law actually impedes a political solution because within a political solution, none of these norms matter. And if Palestinians agree to live underground and breathe through a straw, then that's okay, regardless of the fact that international law would condemn that condition. And so this too is why even in previous administrations, well before Trump, the United States, including I think it was the Bush administration, Scott McLennan, when the ICJ ruled that the route of the uh, wall was illegal for going through Palestinian territory, declared that international law was actually an impediment to peace. So just to put that all in context, now uh, you know, putting the ICC up in flames is basically another attempt to evade accountability and to create a reality on the ground that is forced upon Palestinians. Thanks, Nora. And, and this idea of impunity and accountability is something that, that we keep coming back to in this conversation. Um, it seems in many ways it's, it's the crux of the issue. And I think it's relevant um, as, as something to focus on when we're talking to people on the Hill, because the Hill is, ha, has had, there's been lots of energy over the years to impose oversight, accountability, conditions, restriction, restrictions when it comes to Palestinian behavior. There's been no appetite ever to impose any sort of oversight, let alone accountability 
um, for Israeli behavior, and that, that's, that's come up in, in the Q&A. Um, we're coming towards the end of this, and I think what, what we'd like to do is actually ask you all to, to talk about that. And I'm going to actually hold you all to a four-minute limit. And if you talk for more than four minutes, I'm going to interrupt. Um, but I want to start with Isa. And Isa, I want you, you have four minutes to talk about what your thoughts are in terms of Congress's um, role and Congress's responsibility in the situation uh, that you face on the ground as a Palestinian where Israel has this impunity to act and what you wish Congress would be doing. And the clock starts now. I think the, you know, Israel is trying to say that uh, American doesn't have any influence on Israel, but I can say that uh, the settlements in my city, the majority of the settlers are, you know, they're really getting a lot of money from Hebron Fund, an American organization. I see a lot of American visitors, they visit the, the settlement. I see $3.8 billion being given to Israel every year, to the Israeli military every year. So the, the Congress must act quickly to stop the, you know, to, uh, to stop the Israeli occupation and put high pressure on the Israeli uh, occupation to stop the apartheid, the segregation, and the separation, and make the American fund to Israel conditional on ending the, the Israeli occupation on the ground and respect our human rights. What I want the Congress to do. I want them first to visit Palestine and visit Hebron, especially to see by their eyes the reality on the ground. But what they were told is not uh, the ultimate uh, the truth or the, the picture, you know, it's completely different. The majority of the Congress people who came to Palestine, especially to Hebron, they came back to the United States with a different impression about the, the apartheid and about the, the segregation. I want them to, uh, hear more Palestinian voices as Nora, as Khaled, as you, even Lara, you know, who speaks about the Palestinians. I don't want them to hear about the Palestinians from Fox News. I see, you know, people who are speaking on our behalf, you know, who are not Palestinians, and they say the Palestinians want that, they want that, and they stereotype us. So I want them even to hear and, you know, to listen to more Palestinian uh, voices, to read more about uh, Palestine, and to, you know, to, to know exactly what is the Palestinian narrative. Something else very important, to visibly support the Palestinian nonviolence resistance with all its form, as they support, you know, the uh, Russian uh, opposition and the human rights defenders in Russia, and they support, uh, you know, the Chinese human rights defenders. And now, with Minima, we, the Palestinians, exist, and we deserve, you know, to have visible support for our Palestinian nonviolence resistance. On the other hand, I want them to about, you know, about the PA one sentence about the Palestinian Authority. I don't want them to have the, the relation with the Palestinian Authority with security terms. I want it to be based on political rights and human rights, and even to push them to respect uh, our rights as Palestinians and our free speech. So not to have, you know, blind support to Israel, and even, you know, to give the Palestinian Authority a space to, uh, you know, to do whatever they want for their uh, own people. And I, I, I encourage them to read Human Rights Watch, uh, report about the Palestinian Authority, which described what is happening uh, from its security forces as a torture. And thank I was you. tortured when and I was arrested by the Palestinian Authority. And thank you. I want to add, we didn't have time to get to it. Um, Issa has also been um, arrested and, 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 and tried by, by the Palestinian Authority for his human rights um, civil society activism. Haggai, I want to give the same question to you. And I actually wanted to set this up. There was a letter this week from a group of senators uh, to President Biden and they were talking about Turkey, and I want to read you a sentence from that letter. We believe that the United States must hold allies and partners to a higher standard and speak frankly to them about issues of human rights and democratic backsliding. Now, talk about, you have four minutes, Congress, go. The road for the next, I don't know how many more decades of this injustice is paved, uh, not just with American taxpayers funding, but with Americans' vetoes at the Security Council and with the blanket protection that the U.S. has been providing and is continuing to provide to Israel against any form of accountability. This reality is what has gotten us here in the beginning of 2021. And like no one in Washington should underplay the fact that it is the U.S. more than any other international stakeholder that is responsible 
for this reality. As I said before, the success of this uh, Israeli project has two feet. One is more and more gradual facts on the ground, and the other one is cost-free, blanket impunity, no consequences. And that other feat is, to a great extent, an American feat. And the recent statements that uh, we've begun hearing now that we're back to business as usual in normal days, because this is no longer the Trump administration, but the State Department statements that when asked about you know, the most recent demolition or other human rights violation by Israel, the occupying power against Palestinians, and the refrain from the State Department spokesperson is, we call on both sides uh, not to take, you know, um, unproductive unilateral actions. That statement is appalling. There are no two sides to this. Like, what does people? What do people need to understand when they listen to that? That Palestinian homes need to stop driving themselves into Israeli bulldozers. That Palestinian teens should stop running into like Israeli bullets. Like, is that what is being said? That is not going back to business as usual. That is going back to a morally bankrupt American underwriting uh, of, a policy, of a reality that is unacceptable and needs to be addressed, not in the future, when people will maybe agree that it's not five minutes to midnight, but two minutes to midnight, but it needs to be addressed with a sense of urgency and it needs to be addressed now. Thank you. And Nora, you get the last word uh, in your answer to that same question. Um, again, briefly, go. Um, so I'll start by, by with the conclusion, which is that Congress has actually been a greater impediment to um, applying some form of US accountability and pressure on Israel than any executive administration. In fact, they have impeded executive action from several administrations, from Henry Ford to the Bush administration and Obama who have wanted to exert some forms of pressure but have Im been impeded by their own Congresses. So there is so much to be done here in particular. Um, what are some of those things? I just wanna cite that there are multiple uh, U.S. laws that Congress can apply to its own self. So rather than having international law and applying it upon Israel, it's about the U.S. Um, complying with its own laws. Number one, the Arms Export Control Act, which conditions any form of U.S. provision of military aid with some compliance with human rights law. That's um, just just in compliance with that. And I want to be fully transparent that in 2009, I traveled with a legal delegation to the Gaza Strip and examined how US provided weapons were used against the civilian population and lobbied across the administration as well as congressional um, members on the Senate and the House side just for these members to apply the Arms Export Control Act uh, to not sell white phosphorus to Israel anymore. And even that, the, there was tepidness on the part of Congress. Number two, there's also the Leahy Amendment, which tries to achieve the same thing in the case of gross human rights violations. This is Senator Patrick Leahy, a similar amendment that doesn't end US aid, military aid, but at the very least begins to scrutinize that aid and subject it to similar procedural oversight as it does to other recipients of military aid. Number three is the Mutual Assistance Act between the US and Israel, again, it's about internal US compliance. That's on what Congress can do. Now, what can Congress not do, which is impede now a, a growing landscape in the United States of actually trying to hold the United States to account through grassroots advocacy. The number one thing that Congress can do is stop the criminalization and the punishment of BDS activism, boycott, divestment, and sanctions, which is a grassroots approach that models the anti-apartheid movement in order to overcome diplomatic and transigence on these issues and let the people's power prevail. Number two, another thing that it can do is actually oppose the adoption of the uh, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism that equates criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism and makes this entire discussion that we've had right now subject to some sort of punishment. And the Biden, this was introduced by the Trump administration in an executive order that applies to uh, public universities. It's been endorsed already by the Biden administration. And I would urge this Congress to pay attention that if you can't do what's right, 
which is actually, you know, at least abide by US law, at least do no harm and get out of the way by not punishing those of us who are trying to join in a global struggle for human rights advocacy and freedom and justice for all. Thank you, Noura, and, and thank you, uh, Hagai and, and Aisa and um, my, my friend and colleague, Laura. Uh, we have many, many more issues that we wanted to discuss. And of course, this conversation could, we could do a whole series just on, on human rights, uh, but unfortunately our time is up. Uh, so on behalf of uh, the Foundation for Middle East Peace and the Middle East Institute, I wanna thank all our participants. Um, uh, Hagai, Nora, and Isa, and thanks uh, to all of you for joining us uh, in this webinar, uh, and especially those who submitted questions. Uh, we hope you enjoyed today's session uh, and want to remind you that uh, this same time next Friday, we will have our third part uh, of this series uh, looking at the question of settlements, annexation, and the future of the two-state solution, featuring Zaina Aga, who will be joining us from London, uh, Professor Rashid Khalidi from Columbia University uh, in New York, and Danny Seinemann uh, joining us from Jerusalem. And uh, with that, um, thank you again, and we'll hope to see you next week. <laughs>